for joy. Come before the Lord with praise. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Uh, praise him in the sanctuary. Amen. Thank you so much, choir, uh, for that inspiration this morning and the reminder that no matter where we are, no matter what we go through, we are to always and forever be giving praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God. Now, I will say, maybe you have experienced this, is when you're on the mountaintop, when you're kind of in the sanctuary, when you're kind of worshiping the Lord, it's easier to give praise than sometimes when you're walking through the valley. Sometimes it's hard to give praise. Sometimes when things are going well, and you know, and you're clicking on all cylinders with God, and things are just going great, and you're like, man, praise God. And then there are times in your life where you're like, I didn't see that coming, Did, didn't expect that, and you're like, I don't know that I can give God praise. Much easier when we're on the mountaintop to give God praise, but as the choir reminds us, no matter where we are, no matter what we go through, whether we are, are going through things that we understand or maybe we're going through things that we simply will never understand this side of heaven, we are to give God praise always. You know, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to be turning to Matthew chapter 19 this morning. Actually, we're going to use that as our key text uh, for the text that we find in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 but be turning to Matthew chapter 19 as we look at verses 1 through 9 we'll read those aloud in just a moment as you're turning there as we've been uh, studying and preaching through the Sermon on the Mount uh, through the Beatitudes and now we've gotten into sort of a, an explanation of Jesus saying that this is why I came and not to abolish the law but to fulfill the law to in other words to give it its full and rightful original meaning and, and we've been going through the last three weeks uh, looking at those uh, explanations one of uh, murder and anger really starting in the heart about an angry heart about adultery really starting with a lustful heart you know, and, and as a pastor, this morning's message and the passage of Scripture that we'll be looking at, as well as the one in Matthew chapter 19, uh, I would just tell you a lot of pastors, including me, would be very tempted to skip this passage of Scripture. Would be very tempted to not preach on this particular topic. But it's here in Scripture and it's in the Sermon on the Mount, and so I cannot really rightly skip over it even though there are times that I might want to. For you see this morning, just as Jesus spoke about a, an angry heart, and just as Jesus last week we saw spoke about an unfaithful heart, this morning Jesus is ultimately speaking about a hard heart. It's on the issue of divorce that we use as a jumping off point. Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 in the Sermon on the Mount following up from last week Jesus says it was also said again when he says it was also said in each of these particular areas he's saying you have heard that it was said the Pharisees in particular and we'll see that in just a moment have built up a body of law to a body of interpretation that really has skewed the original meaning of what God had intended you have heard that it was said Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. We'll come back to that in a moment. But I tell you, in other words, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you, who, who's telling? But God himself in the person of Jesus Christ says, I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It, it, just in those two verses alone. It's like, man, I, that's hard. I, I don't know of too many more hard sayings of Jesus than you get right there in those two verses and then the verses we'll see in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, perhaps even harder still uh, is what we find in John chapter 14, verse 6. But as Christians, we're like, I, I, I like that one. What, what does John 14, 6 say? Jesus says, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but I... As Christians, we're like, I, I can get on board with that. I like that one. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. I'm not, not so sure about. Folks, understand there's some hard sayings. There's some hard teachings of Jesus. It probably does not get much 
harder for the pastor or for the hearer than these passages of Scripture. Why? Because there are so many different views on marriage and divorce. There were different views on marriage and divorce in Jesus' day. In in fact, there were different views on marriage and divorce in Moses' day, even in the wilderness wanderings, as we'll see in just a moment. There is a cultural view. Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 3, where Moses allowed for divorce among the Israelites. And understand that when Deuteronomy, we're talking about in the wilderness wanderings, even before they got to the promised land. And there was an instance of easy divorce. It was commonplace. Men could divorce their wives, actually not the other way around though, for what amounted to trivial reasons. That's going all the way back to Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Uh, Jesus alluding to that in Matthew chapter 5. It says this, If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he may write her a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. There were little, if any, safeguards for women back during this time. Wives were seen as little more than property of their husbands. And through that view of cultural significance, there also arose religious views that were heaped on top of the cultural significance. Two schools of thought developed from two leading Jewish rabbis, both Pharisees in the last century B.C. and the first century A.D. And although though Jesus would have been young, perhaps around the age of 13 when Hillel, one of these rabbis, died, he would have been very well acquainted uh, with the schools of thought from both of these well-respected and well-known rabbis. There was Hillel in the house of Hillel. Hillel was a rabbi that lived from 110 B.C. to around 10 A.D. to the ripe old age of 120. On the issue of divorce, Hillel was uh, rather lenient. Uh, Basically, uh, a man could divorce his wife for whatever reason, even trivial reasons such as burning the food. It it was very loose. It was very lenient. But then there was the house of Shammai. Shammai was a rabbi that lived from 50 B.C. to 30 A.D. He lived to be about 80 years of age. Jesus, no doubt, as a young man, no doubt, as a public minister, as a public rabbi, uh, would have been acquainted with Shammai. Most likely, Jesus would also, if he had not met Hillel when he was a young boy in the temple, he would most likely have known of the philosophy and the teachings of these two schools. The house of Shammai was rather strict. They would not allow for divorce except for serious transgressions, such as adultery. And there was a cultural view, there was the religious view, and then there was uh, the view of the people. And whether then or now, cultural, religious, traditional, modern, radical, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the culture's view of marriage is, uh, what the religious view of marriage is, because there are many religions and so-called Christian denominations that get marriage wrong. And it doesn't even matter what your own personal view of marriage is. It does not matter what my own personal view of marriage is. The only view that matters on this or any other issue is God's view and God's view of marriage. And in his view, marriage has not changed from the very beginning. In the beginning, God. Folks, this morning... We do not look at a religious view, we do not look at a cultural view, we do not look even at our own personal views, but at the end of the day we look at God's view, and God's view is very clearly spelled out, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament in and through His Son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. God's view of marriage was revealed at the very beginning, and God's view of marriage was affirmed by God Himself, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity in the New Testament. And so when Jesus speaks, God speaks. When we read the words of Jesus in the New Testament, we are reading not just the inspired God-breathed word of God, which is inspired from Genesis to Revelation, but we are reading the words of God himself. There is no distinction, there is no difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They are the same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
spirit. Sometimes we may not be able to understand that and talk about figuring out the Trinity. If you can figure out the Trinity and be able to explain that, let me know. Because people have been trying to figure it out and explain it from time immemorial. We just have to take it by faith, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But God's view of marriage was affirmed by God the Son, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 19, the, the longest uh, really explanation of marriage and creation. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to stand as we read from Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 uh, through 9. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he departed from Galilee and went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Verse 3, some Pharisees approached him to test him. Folks, understand, Sermon on the Mount, there were no doubt Pharisees in the crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, there were no doubt Pharisees that were following him. May not have been the same Pharisees, but they wanted to catch Jesus. They wanted to find out what this guy is teaching, what this rabbi is teaching. Indeed, here, uh, the Pharisees uh, approached him not to find out what the Son of God would tell them, not to find out what God himself would actually explain. They wanted to test him. So they approached him to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Now, maybe they were coming from the house of Hillel. Maybe that was their philosophy. Can can we just divorce our wife on any grounds? Maybe they were actually followers of Shammai, and they were trying to test him and to see, is he going to to come on the side of Hillel? Is he going to come on the side of Shammai? Is he going to be one that will allow just divorce for any reason, or is he going to allow divorce only for certain reasons? But before he gets to the, the, the question, he goes to the very beginning. Verse 4, haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. He also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. He goes back. He doesn't answer their question immediately, but he goes back all the way to the very beginning, how it was before the fall. We'll look at that in just a moment. All the way to how God intended for marriage to be before the fall verse 7 went why then they asked him did moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away and notice they said command he, moses did not command it and jesus very quickly understood what they were trying to do and verse 8 he told them moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts there it is we we get to the angry heart we get to the unfaithful heart We ultimately this morning are looking at the hard heart. But it was not like that from the beginning. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. There Jesus repeating what he has said in Matthew chapter 5. And if you're like the disciples, and I think today we're like, man, that's a hard saying. If we had to put like our top hard sayings of scripture on a piece of paper, we might put that at somewhere on that list. And we might even respond the way the disciples responded. Verse 10, I said to him, if the relationship of a man with his wife is like that, it's better not to marry. It's going to be that difficult. We might as well not even get married in the first place. What are we going to? Marriage in the beginning is the institution of, that God himself created for our good and for our blessing. For God is a good, good father, perfect in all of his ways. And everything that he created, including the institution of marriage, he blessed and said, it is good. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for marriage as you intended knowing ultimately because of the fall and because of sin that has marred everything in our lives, including the relationships that we have as spouses to one another. Father, I pray this morning that above all else, that you would soften our hearts to hear from you, to submit to your word, and ultimately to submit to Jesus, not only as Savior, but as Lord of our life in every single area of our life, including our marriage and family, and everything else that we deal with in this life. Father, speak to us through your spirit. Uh, Father, change our hearts and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. You may be seated. Folks, this morning understand this, that God's view of marriage never changes because God himself never changes as Hebrews chapter 12 verse 8, 13 verse 8 tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Folks, this morning, the question not just on the issue of marriage, not just on the question of divorce, but really the question on every aspect of our life. How can you and I avoid a hard heart on Jesus' hard teachings? How can you and I avoid a hard heart on Jesus' hard teachings? Uh, this morning, you may be hearing you got that, the teachings on divorce and remarriage. That, uh, that doesn't affect me at all. That, that, I'm good with that. That doesn't affect, no doubt there are others here this morning. That, that's one of the hardest things that you will have to deal with in your life. Maybe you're still dealing with that. But folks, understand, there are going to be hard saints, hard teachings that will hit you square between the eyes. And if it's not on the issue of marriage and divorce, it will be on some other issue And it's a matter of the heart. The whole Sermon on the Mount was about the heart. It starts with our heart. And this morning it starts with a soft heart that is open, that is pliable, that is receptive to God's word. So how can you and I avoid a hard heart on Jesus' hard teachings? First of all, we must submit our heart. We submit our heart to God's word unconditionally. We submit to God's word unconditionally. And that means at the very front that we submit our heart to God's word, the living word, Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That we submit to him and say, God, I've tried to do it myself. I've tried to live my life my own way. But at the end of the day, I simply cannot do it. And we raise up the white flag of surrender. We bow the knee to King Jesus. We repent of our sins. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ask him into our life as our Savior and as our Lord. This morning, if you are to submit in every area of your life, it begins with submission to King Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. If you've never done that, then it will not matter what Scripture says. It will not matter what the Word of God says if you've never submitted to the living Word, Jesus Christ, what his written Word says simply will not have any impact in your life before unless and until you submit to King Jesus unconditionally. Not just with condition. I'd like to submit to Jesus in every area. I, I did that before. Hey, God, I, I'm good except with what I do for a living. I, I'm good except for my, my money. I'm good except for my kids. I, I'm good except for my job. No, Jesus says, I want you to submit to me unconditionally no strings attached have you done that have you submitted to him as savior and lord if not then today is the day of submission because it, the written word truly will not have any impact in your life until you have submitted to king jesus but then when you do that submit to god's word when he talks about creation submit to god's word on creation we go back to matthew chapter 19 god created humans in the very beginning as male and female Uh, folks uh, sin has entered into this world no doubt but god created male and female there are only two genders it does not matter what the culture says it does not matter ultimately what government will say or not say. There will come a time when the government will say that pastors cannot speak about there only being two genders, that there are, I don't know, thousands of yet folks. There is male and there is female. Folks, that's, that's in the beginning. And in the beginning, God said it was good. There are two, male and female. We need to submit to God's word on creation, and that means with marriage. God created the covenant of marriage and intended it for it to be one man and one woman at one time for all time until death do us part. If that was the end of the story, we would go, okay, that's good. That's not the end of the story, is it? Because in chapter 3 of Genesis, sin entered into the world. And folks, I I'm not here to debate what happened in Genesis chapter 1. I believe that the God of the universe could speak the world and the universe into existence in six literal 24-hour days. But I will tell you this. God says, everything that I've created is good. And in Genesis chapter 3, there was a real Garden of Eden. There was a real Adam and Eve. There was a real serpent. 
And there was a real fall into sin that has impacted humanity since that very moment till this moment in time. Why do I say that? Because if you do not believe that there was a real Garden of Eden, if you do not believe that there was a real Adam and Eve, if you do not believe that there was a real serpent in the garden, if you do not believe that there was a real fall into sin, then there is no reason for a real Savior to have come and died on the cross of Calvary. If all of that is a myth, then what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary is simply meaningless. And our faith is in vain but folks i do not believe that i believe that jesus is who he says he is he's done what he said he would do and he has defeated the enemy by his death his burial and his resurrection but because of the fall sin entered the world and it has marred every area of our lives including how we view marriage including our relationship with god himself which is why jesus christ had to come the first place we must submit to god's word we must submit to god's word on creation we must submit to god's word on marriage and what is god's word on marriage it is not just in genesis chapters 1 through 3 folks but it is also in matthew chapter 19 for jesus who is god himself god in the flesh affirms that the creation is male and female he affirms that the covenant of marriage is good and there will be some that will say well jesus never spoke about marriage Jesus never talked against gay marriage. Jesus never said anything about transgenderism. Jesus never, said, Jesus never spoke about little green men living on the far side of the moon either. Just because Jesus did not say something does not mean that it is true. But Jesus did say something about marriage. He did say something about creation. And what Jesus said, even if you don't have a red letter edition Bible, Every single word that Jesus said is the word of God because Jesus Christ is God. And so he affirms what God in the beginning has created. He affirms what God has said and intended for marriage. And if we're to submit to God's word as the Savior, if we're to submit to God's word on creation, if we're to submit to God's word on marriage, yes, this morning uh, we must in this passage of Scripture submit to God's word on divorce. And Jesus affirms that divorce, except for sexual immorality, is both sinful and serious. Except for sexual immorality. And some would say, well, Pastor, I, what does that mean? I could probably preach a whole sermon on what sexual immorality means. But folks, understand this. Divorce, except for sexual immorality, is a sin. I can't, that's not me saying that. That's Jesus. So if you want to get mad with somebody please don't get mad with me although I, that's that's all right i can take it but I, i'm just telling you what jesus says but at the end of the day any of our sin you don't have to come to me to confess your sin you don't have to come to me to justify your sin i don't have to come to you to confess my sin or to justify my sin we sin against god and god alone and you don't have to come to a priest or to a pastor Or anybody, you can come boldly and directly to the throne of grace that you might receive mercy and grace for every sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit. Folks, divorce is sin. It's just sometimes more public than many of our private sins. It's more public. Folks, if we were honest with ourselves that today at at some point, it might be small, it might be big, I I don't know, we're going to sin. Every single one of us is going to sin in some way. Maybe it's something that we should have done and did not do. Maybe it's something that we did and did not do. And we might say, well, I I think I got that covered. Well, maybe it's your motives. Maybe it's your thoughts. Maybe it's something that people can't. Most of our sin is private. Folks, we don't just publicize it out for the world to see. But folks understand sin is sin. And the sin of divorce is no more or no less A sin than gossip, or slander, or angerness, or lust, or adultery. In God's eyes, every single sin that we commit is an affront to Him. That we must ultimately deal with Him about. Even as Christians, 1 John 1, 9, if we what? confess our sin what does it mean to confess if we agree with god that what we have done is sin and we confess our sin what he is faithful 
and just. Forgive us of our sin to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, go to God with your sin. Ask him to forgive. He will, just like any other sin that we have ever committed or ever will commit. The sin of divorce is covered by the blood of Jesus. I do not believe that it's an accident or coincidence that we find in John chapter 4. The moving story of, of a woman, not, not just any woman, but a woman who was ostracized for, from her community, was ostracized from her family. No one wanted to be around her. That's why she had to come to draw water from the well in the heat of the day around noontime because that was when she could come and nobody else was there. Most of the other women would come in the cool of the evening to draw water from the well, but not this woman on this particular day Jesus and his disciples would be passing by and Jesus just so happened to send his disciples away and just so happened that the woman came and it was like why Jesus I didn't see her come I didn't know she was going to be here I think I think Jesus knew he knew there was going to be a divine appointment that day the divine appointment not just with anybody but with this woman who came and began to talk with this Jewish rabbi, and this Jewish rabbi began to talk to her, and that was not to be heard of either, much less to talk with this woman. For this woman had been married to divorce not once, not twice, not three times, four, now should we try five? And the, woman, the, the man that she was living with at that time was not even her husband. And Jesus began to talk with her. And as only the Savior could, began to change her life and change her heart and redeem her from the inside out. And said, if you you only knew who was offering you water to drink, you would drink of this water and you would never, ever thirst again. And when she knew she drank of the water, the living water, and all of her sins, past, present, future, nailed to the cross, even though the cross was still yet to come, little did she know that all of her sins would be covered by the blood of this man who would deign to speak with her in the heat of the day at the well. Folks, every sin that we ever commit against a holy God, we need to confess. And as we confess and repent of that sin, all of our sin, past, present, and future, nailed to the cross, we bear it no more. That's why Romans chapter 8 verse 1 can say for those who are in Christ Jesus for those who know Jesus as Savior and Lord for those who have bent the knee for those who have submitted to his kingship for those who have had the blood applied to their lives for those who are in Christ Jesus there is now no condemnation a little bit later in John John chapter 8 we read of another woman caught in the very act of adultery usually takes at least two people to be caught in the act of adultery. The man, nowhere to be found. The woman brought out to be stoned. Jesus would there that day uh, interact with that woman, interact with all of the men there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rulers of the law, and he would bend down and write in the sand. Nobody really knows exactly what he wrote. There's speculation that he began to write the sins of those men in in the sand we we don't know that that's purely speculation but we do know what jesus said to the men because adultery was a a stoning offense adultery was to be uh, stoned to death he says ye who are without sin what go ahead and throw that first stone he said one by one remember what i said one by one from the oldest to the youngest. Why, why do you think from the oldest? A lot of sin over the course of a lifetime. They all walked away. They all dropped their stones. But notice what Jesus said to the woman. She says, are, are you going to condemn me? No, I, I'm not going to condemn you. But here's the truth. Go and sin no more. In our heart, We must be softened to the idea that sin is an affront to a holy God. And no matter the sin, we must be willing to confess and repent of that sin and know that when we do, that God will 
be forgiving. But not only is sin, not only is divorce a sin, but divorce is serious. And divorce, like every other sin, has consequences in our relationships. Sometimes those are long-lasting, sometimes those are life-changing. That's why I believe Malachi says that God hates divorce as he does all sin. Folks, when we fail to submit to God's word, when we fail to submit to God's will, when we fail to submit to God's way, no matter the issue in our life, we will ultimately find ourselves choosing poorly. We will often find ourselves making poor choice after poor choice after poor choice, which leads to a hard heart, which leads to a state of rebellion. Just this past week on Friday, very popular Christian author by the name of Josh Harris uh, wrote several books in the late 90s, one of which was I Kiss Dating Goodbye, very popular in evangelical circles. And this past Friday, he uh, shared with the world on Instagram uh, that he was divorcing his wife of 21 years, and that he was now openly uh, approving and embracing of the LGBT lifestyle including so-called same-sex marriage and if that were not enough he said oh by the way I'm actually no longer a Christian I'm renouncing my faith and walking away from the church said, that did not happen overnight Josh Harris did not just wake up one morning and go, I think I'm done with my marriage. I think I'm done uh, with Christianity. I, I think I'm going to embrace everything the culture embraces. I'm just, I'm done. That, did, that doesn't happen. It happens incrementally, little over little over little over time, where we fail to submit to the authority of King Jesus and where we fail to submit to the authority of his word. This morning, where's your heart? Have you submitted to him? as king have you submitted to him as lord today this day are you choosing one of those thirty-five thousand choices that we talked about last week are you choosing to submit your life to king jesus as lord of your life today submit your heart to him if you do it will allow you to guard your heart in proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 Uh, We read, guard your heart above all else. Why? For it is the source of life. Jesus in Matthew 15, 19 tells us, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimony, slander. Folks, in other words, guard your heart. Submit your heart uh, to God's word, but guard your heart with God's word courageously. How do we guard our heart? Above all else, know God's word. Read Psalm 119, longest chapter in all of Scripture. Go back and read Psalm 119, and you will see the importance of knowing and carrying out God's Word. Know God's Word. Psalm 119, 11, some of you know this verse by heart. I have treasured, I have stored up, I have what? Hidden your Word in my heart. And what's heart? It's emotions, affections, intellect, it's will. It's not just feelings, but it's all of those. I've hidden, I've stored up your Word in my heart. What? That I might not sin against you. Know God's Word. You, you may not always have this to carry with you. You may not always have a cell phone that you can pop out and get on a, a, a Bible app. Know God's word. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart so that when you hear something that's false, you know, wait, wait a minute, that's, that's not what God's word says. Know God's word. But not only know God's word, delight in God's word. Delight in his very word. Folks, that, that word delight, man, there's a lot of things we can delight in. And a lot of times, food is one of those things we delight in. You can look at me and know that I delight in food a lot, probably more than I need to. But man, good food, man, I delight in that. And there's probably not very often that I go without delighting in some type of food. But man cannot live on bread. Man cannot live on food alone, but what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you delight in God's word more than you delight in earthly food? Day by day, do you pick up his word and do you read it? Do you meditate upon it? The psalmist in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bear fruit that bears 
its fruit and its season, and his leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Do you delight in his word? This is something that every day you're like, I delight in his word. Well, I, man, I wish I could say that every single day. I'm just like, more, more. That, that's how we should be, right, Miss Connie? Just more, more. Every day, are you I just ask, Lord, give, give me something more. Give me something more from your word. God's word should be our delight. Are you delighting in it? And then if you're delighting in it, if you know it, you should be observing it. Joshua chapter 7, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. God speaks to Joshua. He speaks to us this morning. Above all, be what? Strong and very courageous. What? To observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You're to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Are, are you guarding your heart with his word? Are you guarding your heart by being in his word? Are you guarding your heart by knowing it? By delighting in it? By observing it? If not, then today, ask the Lord to give you a, a, a new appetite. A greater appetite for his word that might guard you because as we do as we submit as we guard our heart then might we love sacrificially with our heart those who God has put into our lives if you're married love your spouse sacrificially what does that mean to love your wife sacrificially Ephesians chapter 5 the picture of Jesus in the church the bride of Christ. Husbands, love your wives as what? Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Sacrificially. He gave his life for the church. And I, I know what you're saying. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. That, isn't there some word up higher up for, for wives to, to submit? Yes, yeah, there. That's not this sermon, but it's there. Another hard saying. But husbands... Love your wives sacrificially as Christ loved the church and laid down his very life for the church. I, I'm not going to guarantee 100%, but I'll almost guarantee it. That your wives are going to lovingly, graciously, under the headship of Jesus Christ, submit to the authority that God has placed in their life over you. But the higher standard to love your wife sacrificially as Christ loved the church. If we love our spouse, if we love our children, if we love brothers and sisters in Christ, yes, if, even if we love our enemies sacrificially, if we guard our heart and we ultimately submit to the authority of King Jesus and to the authority of his word, that is the way that you and I can avoid a hard heart with Jesus hard teachings. What hard teaching is it that you need to have your heart softened by King Jesus this morning? Maybe, maybe it's divorce, maybe it's remarriage, maybe it's something else. Submit to King Jesus and to his word and allow him to soften your heart to hear his word. Let's pray. Father God, thank you.